Hello everybody, today we're going to have a look at the PM5644, probably one of the most infamous but mysterious test pattern generators ever made. Some may say that this is coming 20 years too late. Yep, it is. But it is better late than never. Now throughout this video, we're going to be talking about what the PM5644 is and what it definitely isn't. And we have a couple of units out here. We have the CCAM 4x3 unit, which we saw back in video number 4. And later on, we're going to be giving this thing a big upgrade. Well, that actually already has that upgrade right now, but I'm going to be taking you through the process of how that was engineered, built, and installed. And we also have the infamous Unicorn widescreen version out as well, because I couldn't possibly make a video about this product family without at least demonstrating that. What is the PM5644? Could it be this? No. What about this then? No. Okay, this? No. And as for this... Do I even have to say it? PM5644 only refers to a physical piece of equipment which generates a test card. As for which test card, well, that could be just about anything. And the same applies to the 4x3 circle pattern, commonly referred to as PM5544. Once again, strictly speaking, this only refers to the piece of equipment on the right. The test card on the left may have been generated by it, but more likely it was generated by something else. Equally, that 5544 may have been modified to generate a completely different output. Casual use of this kind of terminology is perfectly fine, but once we start getting into specifics, it quickly becomes problematic, as you can hopefully now see. And the main thing we have to remember is that the company was selling physical equipment, not test cards. When you purchased the PM5544, you received a physical piece of equipment. You bought that equipment not solely because of the test card it generated, but also because of its high reliability, incredibly pure output, low energy consumption, low maintenance costs, etc. That is what the PM5544 meant to you, not just the image of its output. And as a side note, this is exactly how the Phillips pattern ended the international career of Test Card F. During the 1970s, it had to be generated by a slide scanner, which was none of the above. And it wasn't really feasible to design an electronic generator for it at that time, but it did eventually get one in 1984. Now, unfortunately, that was too late for overseas users. In the context of the 5644, this piece of equipment is rather significant because it is one of the earliest digital source electronic test card generators. Internally, it is almost entirely digital and the test cards it generated were designed on computers. This was a radical new paradigm and would have raised eyebrows at Philips because it was significantly more advanced than what they had at the time. See, their generators, while entirely electronic, were mostly comprised of analog circuitry. The scope of modifications to the output was limited and difficult to implement. The BBC, on the other hand, could reprogram their generators with whatever test card they liked without even having to switch on the soldering iron. The ability to do this would have been the envy of Philips, but the company would have to wait. In 1984, building a device like this was a tall order and eye-wateringly expensive. If they were to attempt their own, it would not have made a profit. But five years later, when integrated circuit technology had sufficiently progressed, Philips' own digital source generator, the PM5644, finally became a reality. But anyway, I digress. If not named after equipment, what were the patterns officially called? Well, I went through all of the literature I could possibly find, manuals, brochures, catalogues, newsletters, etc. And this is the complete list of all of the ways that the company referred to the actual patterns. And the most descriptive is the last one there, but that didn't show up until the 1990s. Ironically, if you were to show an average person on the street the image of the circle pattern and ask them to describe it, they would tell you that it's a test pattern, which is actually closer to being historically and technically correct than what you will get out of somebody supposedly in the know. Before we start talking about hardware, first of all, I just want to take a few minutes to talk about people. Nearly everybody with an interest in the circle pattern would have heard of its creator. Now, I'm not going to say too much about him today because it is off topic for this video. But a few things which should be said here is that while his contributions were significant, specifically convincing his boss to let him work on the project, inventing it, and then convincing skeptical senior managers in the Netherlands to adopt it, it should also be pointed out that he moved to a different division of the company in 1970 to focus on satellite navigation, which was closer aligned to his personal passion of sailing. And this was just four years after the circle pattern was invented. From then onwards, his work would be carried on by others, and boy was there a lot of work to do. And speaking of others, there is another big character behind the circle pattern that I would like to introduce. 
Gunnar Bekgaard. Joining the company as a sprightly young lad at the birth of the circle pattern, he would devote his entire career to it, working on the design of equipment, production engineering, documentation, customer support, fronting trade shows, and even personally supporting the final PT5300 until his retirement day, which by no coincidence was the final day of analog television in Denmark. For 40 years, he was the man behind the circle pattern. What a legend. He is also the designer of the PM5644, that is the box sitting on top of that TV, not the test card he's pointing at. To the left of him is Preben Christiansen, the developer of the PM5644's firmware. Being such a software driven beast, this was also a significant contribution, and I could really have used his help in making this video. More about that later on. Before we get to the PM5644 itself, we're going to talk about this test card here. I really didn't want to take this video by talking about it, but we need to talk about it. If you have ever searched for PM5644 on the internet, you have seen this. It is in your face. It is everywhere. All over the traditional internet, in hundreds of YouTube videos. And one of those videos even has 230,000 views at the time of recording. Wow! I have seen it used for actual experiments by other YouTubers. It has even made a cameo appearance on real television in the UK. Yeah, I'm glad they didn't use a real Phillips pattern for that. So what the heck is it? Well, I'm not entirely sure, but here are some things I found out about it. It probably originates from the Spanish company Promax Electronics, and for many years they have sold various pieces of equipment which generate a pattern visually exactly like it, from purely analog models to more advanced digital models like this one. But the company does not describe it as PM5644 in their documentation. So how did the Promax test card become the de facto quote-unquote PM5644? I have no f***ing clue, but maybe someone else out there knows the answer for sure. It first appeared on the internet in June 2008, uploaded to Wikipedia by an unidentifiable user called RTFM ASAP, with no information as to where it actually came from. As to whether or not that person actually read the manual, I doubt it. That person immediately put it up on the Phillips Pattern Wikipedia page, overwriting a legitimate capture. But the editors at the time quite rightly took it down. The image is still on Wikipedia, lending it some credence, but it doesn't appear on any credible pages. The test card then appeared a second time in February 2009, this time on YouTube, uploaded by a user with no apparent connection to the Wikipedia image. Now this video is interesting because unlike the Wikipedia mock-up, it looks vaguely legitimate, like it might have come from one of these Promax generators, perhaps? But once again, frustratingly, the uploader does not say where it came from, which is suspicious. I reached out to a Phillips Pattern Uber expert, the guy who drew these diagrams. And what he told me is that there are a number of significant technical inconsistencies in the pattern depicted in that video. Thus, it is unlikely to be a legitimate test card. So that unfortunately leaves us empty-handed. How the output of this obscure piece of Spanish test equipment made the leap to the internet and somehow became thought to be the legendary PM5644, well, I just can't really tell you. Or perhaps you could argue that the Promax version is itself the legend. I don't know. But there is no question of how it became so prolific, and that was the decision to produce the original mock-up of the pattern in HD 1080p. Now, Promax do sell an HD-capable generator, but it does not generate a high-definition Phillips pattern. Now, this unfortunate act of artistic licensing is certainly the reason why it is everywhere. Most people looking for this test card don't really care whether or not it is genuine or accurate, because they're just using it as a prop, and they really just want the highest resolution, prettiest rendition of it that they can possibly get. And that is precisely what the 2008 Promax mock-up is. Now as it happens, Promax wasn't the only company with an alternate widescreen circle pattern. Here is the effort by Roden Schwarz, and given the sketchiness of the Promax test card's ascent, I'm actually rather surprised that it didn't become the de facto PM5644, because it did have an evolutionary advantage. The generating equipment was more common, and being even simpler in design, it's even easier to convert to a vector graphic and scale to whatever the heck resolution you want. The fundamental problem here is lack of reliable information. No paper manuals from the 1990s appear to have been preserved, and thanks to corporate dealmaking, the PM5644 as a product has long since been thrown on the bonfire. 
and as a result, no documentation is obtainable in retrospect either. Bereft of information, people basically just made shit up. And that is why I said this video is too late. The damage is already done. Most people who had an interest in this topic today have forgotten about it and moved on. And for those who are still interested, well, that Promax mock-up is not going away anytime soon. By now we know what the PM5644 isn't, so let's talk about what it is. Amusingly, even the company is guilty of overusing the model number somewhat because there are three separate, completely different product families which carried it. So let's run through them. The original design is what I call the GBG version, and that is the initials of the designer, and to me this is the true PM5644. There are three-ish variations of it. Now, firstly the 5643, not a circle pattern generator, but I thought I'd just throw that one in there because it does use the same hardware. Next up is the composite generator, and as the name suggests, it has a composite video output. Most units sold were this version, and all of the known survivors are this version too. And the reason for this is because they came from lab or TV factory applications where they actually had a chance of being preserved. And finally, the 5644 component generator. Not to be confused with the 5643, this one generates a signal which is split into components like RGB or YUV. And these were typically only used in broadcast where unfortunately they had little chance of avoiding the scrap heap. I'm not aware of any surviving units. If we consider that these things were available in PAL BG, PAL I, DK, M, N, and that each could be composite, RGB, or YUV, we've already got 15 different versions of this damn thing, and we're still talking about PAL 4x3 circle patterns here. Then consider that there are CCAM and NTSC variants, and versions with a widescreen pattern, or a Telefunken pattern, and widescreen versions of that, and even a Philips take on the Indian head pattern. By crikey, there were a heck of a lot of different versions of this product. And on a side note, all but one of the nine surviving units are unique. And in addition to this, the company also sold versions with custom patterns, bringing the total number of different variations likely to more than 100. And next up we have our first quasi-5644, the HDTV generator. This was part of the company's Eureka 95 efforts, specifically HDMAC, which also stretched to televisions and optical media. It is the only high-definition circle pattern generator ever commercialized, but unfortunately the technology never made it out of the lab. I remember reading somewhere that the company was very excited to have sold one of them. I wasn't able to find any pictures of one or any mention of a surviving sample. This here is the pattern that it generated. From a distance it looks the same as the standard definition pattern, but it is significantly different in the details. It is a real shame that no high quality reproductions of its pattern are available because I think a lot of people would be really interested to see it. Lastly, we have the Power Plus generator. Now this thing is mostly a variation of the earlier HDTV generator, but different enough internally to be classed as a separate product, and certainly has a completely different purpose. As the name suggests, it is for testing Power Plus, and that is all that is for. I have half produced a Power Plus video in which this piece of equipment is used and demonstrated, but Power Plus being a nightmare of a technology to explain, I got tired of it and it went on the back burner, but I'll finish it one day, I promise. Now it is time for a game of Spot the PM3644. Now if you're from a circle pattern country, the odds are that that test card you remember from days of old may have been generated by one of these things. They, they seem to have sold pretty well. I found quite a lot of recordings that I think would be generated by one of these on YouTube. So we're going to talk about how to, to, to spot them. Now, superficially, circle patterns can all look quite similar, but there are little details that we can look for to work out what is actually generating them. Now for this demonstration, we have the PT5300 out here. Now we're not really looking for PT5300 patterns today, but the reason we have it out is because it has an annoying habit of generating an output which is damn near indistinguishable from the 5644. So we need to be able to tell these two apart if we want to be able to do this. Now the first thing that we would look for is the text. Now we are very specifically looking for this font and it has to look exactly like this. If the font does not look exactly like this, then we can rule it out straight away. And in one of the other clues is the presence of lowercase characters, and the earlier generators did not do lowercase characters. So we know if we see that font, we are probably looking at one of these two pieces of equipment. Not necessarily the 5300, could be one of its immediate predecessors. But anyway, we're, that's a good starting point. Now, a lot of the times the pattern is customized and the text is missing, and we won't have any text in the top or bottom boxes. And if that's the case, then the only thing you have to go on is the clock. And if the clock is missing, by the way, then, well, you just can't really tell. There's no way to know what is generating the test card. 
But if the clock is present and we see the date, then in the date specifically looking like this, then we know once again that we are looking at one of these two pieces of equipment. Um, because the earlier models, like the 5534, uh, for example, that, that didn't have the ability to show the date. Uh, but it's often the case that the date is, is not activated, so we just have the time. So we mainly have to focus our attention on the time. And once again, the, the, the time has to look exactly like this. This font, digits separated by colons as well. It's very important. Um, in Denmark, they seem to be dots in, in this position here. I think that's a, that's a custom firmware, which you just see in, in, in that country. Um, but that's the same thing. That's still going to be one of these two if you, if you see that. So anyway, that's how, we, that's how we would tell if it is one of these two pieces of equipment. Um, so the next thing we have to do is try to work out if it is the 5644 specifically. And in order to be able to do that, we have to look a little bit closer. Now there's a couple of clues uh, which may or may not be present depending on the quality of the recording. Uh, for a PT5000 series generator, around the text the black level is elevated slightly. So you have this black box around here, but then the text has, has another slightly lighter black box around it. And this is a luminance keying mechanism uh, which is unique to these, um, these, this equipment. And if you see this, you know straight away it's, it's one of these. But you may not be able to see that. It depends on the quality of the recording. I actually found a real world example of it here in this test card, very clearly visible. Um, and if, if you cannot see that, then there is another possible way to do it. And once again, this is not a given. And that's to look at the, the bottom box here. For the 5644, certainly all of the units which have ever been demonstrated and had their patterns dumped, the reflection check, that's this white bar here, is always missing on the 5644. I don't know why, but they just, they never put it there. Whereas on the PT5000 series, they, they brought it back again. So you know that if you see this bar, that it's, it's going to be one of these. So anyway, that is, uh, that's how we tell our 4x3 circle patterns apart. Um, now I was thinking we might do this for the widescreen versions as well, but honestly, there's not really any point because the, the widescreen 5644 pattern is so, so distinctly different from the patterns that you get out of this type of generator that there's not really any point in dwelling on that. If you're really interested to know, go and have a look at the Wikipedia page. They're all very well documented on there. Next up, we're going to talk about that upgrade for the 4x3 CCAM unit. I know some people are going to be disappointed that we're not doing anything with the widescreen version, but remember, the title of this video is the real PM5644. As I had said repeatedly, for the most part, it was a 4x3 product that was the dominant TV format during its life, and that is what the engineers put most of their effort into. So out of respect for the product and the people behind it, the 4x3 is what we're going to be focusing on today. The upgrade in question is the PM8546, also known as the Logo Generator. It is the hardware option which is installed inside of a PM5644, which generates the station ID text clock, and optionally also can insert a monochrome or color logo. Originally priced at around about $2,000, it would have only been ordered for units used in broadcast. And as I have said, those are very unlikely to survive. And if they do survive, they generally don't tend to come to the second-hand market. And certainly none of the known survivors came from a broadcast application. As an enthusiast owner, of course you want this option. And I've long had a particular interest in obtaining one because I wanted to see if it is the hardware behind this type of test card, of which there are many recordings and images of from all around the world on the internet and on YouTube. As we have seen in my previous videos, it wasn't the only hardware which generated these test cards, but I think it was the original and the most common. My quest for a logo generator has now dragged on for years. The only one known to have survived came from the Loewe TV factory in Germany and belongs to a collector who is unwilling to entertain the idea of doing anything which could possibly lead to it being cloned. So this image of it is the closest I've ever come. I haven't even managed to get a demo of it out of him, which is really frustrating. A fast forward to today, and the situation has improved. We have its schematics and PCB design files and are now able to build exact copies of the original hardware. We have the code for the character proms from another source, but unfortunately the original firmware and code for the programmable logic chips remains out of reach. So hypothetically, it was now possible to recreate the logo generator, but damn, it was gonna be difficult because the missing code would have to be rewritten. 
The first job was to re-implement the code in the programmable array logic chips. It didn't feel like it at the time, but in hindsight, this was actually fairly easy, and I did have a little bit of help. This clip records the first moment when I saw my build generating some actual texts. It's just saying hello. It looks absolutely terrible, and this was because of a dodgy clock signal and a counterfeit chip that I bought off eBay, but I fixed those problems pretty quickly. This setup here looks rather hairy, and that's because I had to use a large logic analyzer in order to be able to debug all of the logic working together. And there's the logic analyzer down on the floor there. It's a screensaver on at the moment because I only ever connect to it remotely over the network. Once that was all working with the Hello World firmware, next it was time to reverse engineer the firmware in the base unit, which of course I do have. The two microcontrollers communicate using a multi-drop RS-232 interface. And the microcontroller in the base supplies configuration to the logo generator through either the buttons on the front panel or through skippy commands through the GPIB interface on the rear. The reverse engineering process was really painful and went on for months. Literally, it was a case of sifting through tens of thousands of lines of this. But it was double-edged. On one hand, it was really hard, but on the other hand, I learned a lot about the logo generator in the process. Most importantly, the details of the protocol and all of the many commands the two microcontrollers exchange between each other. At the same time, I also had to reverse engineer most of the Skippy commands in the base unit. And finding the commands wasn't all that hard, but working out what all the parameters are, ouch. Once again, this was weeks of work. For months, I tortured the firmware in the base trying to work out how to implement a logo generator which would attach to it. And not one single time did it crash or do anything unexpected. Damn, these guys were good. Now many will remember my efforts from video number 7. As impressive as those looked, to me the effort of recreating the logo generator puts that entire project well and truly in the shade. In December 2023, after years of searching and months of graft, the project is finally complete. I have a working logo generator which can generate an identical output to the original, and 20 years after it was last seen on air, I'm able to recreate a fully functioning version of the original widescreen pattern once more. That first logo generator I built was for the PAL widescreen unit. I didn't film the construction of it, but for today's efforts we have to build another one. Unlike the PT8631, which I built back in video number 7, building these things is easy, like a hobbyist kit set from the 1980s. Ah... That is the deal, by the way. You don't get a video out of me unless I get to build at least something. Now, the unit we're going to be building here is going to be specifically for CCAM. It is possible to use the PAL version for CCAM, but it's a bit of a waste of components. So here is our completed CCAM logo generator. And as we can see, it has a lot of unpopulated components. And the reason for this is because of how the base generator board is designed. So normally in the PAL version, we would have three different channels here, Y, U, and V, but those are unpopulated in the CCAM version, and we only just have the one channel. Um, and the reason is because of how they've basically designed this thing. So rather than having, rather than encoding a CCAM signal in, in analog circuitry in here, what they do is they just software modulate the color subcarrier into the board, what basically is the Y channel. So we basically just have this one single generator path here. And what this means is that there's no possibility of varying the phase relationship between the color subcarrier and the sync like the power version would be able to, but that concept doesn't even exist in CCAM anyway, so this is a perfectly good way to do it. And CCAM coders are kind of in finicky thing to make, so I think this was a pretty sensible decision. And this has a significant impact on the design of the logo generator because it means that there's only one channel to alter. So if we have a look at the PAL version of it here, this is the PAL widescreen version, there are three channels, and these are going to be either R, G, and B, or Y, U, and V, depending on the configuration. Um, this thing is actually able to insert color logos or even color text. Now, I don't know of any definitive examples of this in the real world. There's, looking around YouTube, there's a number of videos which may be an example of it, but... I think it was a feature which was really, very rarely ever used. But what basically happens is that you have three, three outputs here. You have Y, U, and V, and they will go down to the base generator board, and then they are mixed with the Y, U, and V of the main um, pattern generating circuitry, and then they're all encoded as one signal up here. But in the CCAM version, of course, we don't have those other channels. We've only got the one channel. Now, I'm on the record as saying that you cannot mix 
pre-encoded CCAM signals together, and I stand by that assertion, but there is one specific scenario where you can, and that is where you can mix the monochrome portions of a CCAM signal with a, another synchronized monochrome signal, and that's exactly what the logo generator in the CCAM version relies on. So what it will basically do is uplift the absolute voltage of the output where it wants to insert some text, and basically leaving the color subcarrier, the color subcarrier being at rest, intact. Now another thing to notice about this is that there's only one chip on here which has a Philips part number on it, and the rest of them all say open PM8546. So this, uh, this, the code for this chip here came from DK Technologies, and it was absolutely key in doing this recreation. Um, there would have been no hope of doing this without it. The, the reason that they have this is because it was used to generate the character proms for the PT5000 series generators, like the PT5300, for example. Um, in those versions of it, they, they have an anti-aliased character set, um, which is generated from this PROM here, and this one is aliased. Very important difference, and the, the format of it is also completely different as well. It's designed for this hardware. So yeah, very, just amazing that they had this. Um, but yeah, the rest of it says open PM8546, and as you probably would have guessed, this is my, my um, recreation of all of the other code on this board. And I've put this as an open source project up on my GitHub, link in the description. I don't think many people will be making use of it, but just for, you know, for the sake of openness, I'm making this fully available to everybody. So anybody else can hypothetically build this as well. So now it is time for a quick demonstration, and the purpose of this is just to give you a sense of what it would be like to unbox a broadcast PM5644 back in the early 1990s. Now frustratingly, the collector who owns the only original logo generator, he could have actually done this demonstration himself, he even has a YouTube channel, but for whatever reason, he, despite having owned it for like four or five years, well he just hasn't really done it yet, so you're going to have to listen to me instead. Now to configure the logo generator, pretty much the easiest way to do it is to take up the front panel and we push this button on the end here and this goes into a configuration mode. Now normally without a logo generator you would only have one LED blinking and that would allow you to go into a mode where you can basically set or clear the clock cutouts and that's really all you get. But when the logo generator is installed and detected, you, when we go into this mode here, we actually have four LEDs blinking, and this is indicating that we have a whole lot of extra functionality to configure. So let's run through it all. Now the first mode here is this one, um, which does appear without the logo generator, and this button down here will basically activate or clear the clock cutouts. Now normally you wouldn't see any actual clock in there, but because I have a logo generator present, the clock actually appears. Now a lot of broadcasters actually only use the clock just like that, but I prefer to have the date activated as well um, because it lets you know when I'm actually filming these videos. Now obviously the year is not 1992, that's just the default in this instance. And the other settings that we have in this mode here is to change the format of the date. So we can have ISO or US or European time, I think are the three options there. Um, we can change the format of the time, so 12 or 24 hour. So if we go out of that mode, um, the next mode we can go into is to actually set the date, and that's this first one here. So by pushing the buttons, you're just incrementing the numbers, just like that, pretty straightforward really. And if we go out of that one, we can set the time like this. Really, really easy. Um, now the main and most interesting mode here is the this one here, which enters the text editor mode. Now this is a feature which nobody really knew about in the PM8546 until I reverse engineer it, that it actually has this interactive text editor where you can edit the text in pattern. And it's not something that you see in like the PT5300, for example. You do it on an LCD panel down, LCD screen down the front panel there. Um, and this is also another point where I wasn't really entirely sure in my recreation because you have all of these controls on here and you can kind of work out what they do from looking at the commands they send to the logo generator, but in some cases it's not entirely clear. So what we're running through here is my recreation of it. Now this button up here would uh, delete characters from the currently selected text box. Um, so if I delete them all, then I can push this one here to insert a new character like that. And then after I've got another one that, I can insert another one like that and so on. 
So this is the this is the editing experience that I have here, and as I say, I, I copied this from the PT5300, um, but I don't know I don't know if that's exactly what the 8546 would be like in practice because never seen one running, don't have the manual for it, no idea. But it has to be something like this because it fits quite nicely into the controls that we have here. And um, the other thing that which you can do in this mode, which you cannot do in, say, the PT5300, is um, enter into a logo editing mode. Um, and this this button here is one of the ones I wasn't really sure about. Uh, it's like a mode toggle button, not really cl clear what it actually does. But studying the, the hardware, you, each text box has two different modes. There's a text mode or a logo mode. It's very much one or the other. You can't mix and match them. So that's what I used it for. It's a toggle between those two modes. So when the light is off, that means you're in text mode. But if you push the button and turn it on, then we go into logo mode. And we can insert a logo like that. And we can do the same on the bottom box. So that's currently in text mode. We'll put it in logo mode. And we can put in a Philips logo like that. And these are the only two logos that the logo generator actually comes with out of the box. And if you wanted any other logos, you would either have to insert your own or maybe pay Philips to customize it. Don't really know whether or not they allowed people to insert their own, but it's pretty pretty easy if you do want to. Basically, all you need is a computer and EFORM programmer and some basic programming skills. Very easy. Um, so yeah, that's that's basically the the main functionality. And I, as I said, very have to put a very big caveat on here because I don't really know precisely how what the original firmware is like to interact with. I really hope that I, I can find it someday, but for now, that is all that I can really show you. Well, that is all for today's video, and the big disappointment here has been that inability to find the original logo generator firmware. Now, the company sold a lot of these things, so there must be a unit out there somewhere that could be dumped. If you're a person who either owns that unit or has access to it and you're willing to help out, please let me know. I will book a plane ticket, I will fly to you with the necessary equipment to dump it if need be. But equally, if you're a person who has one of these things and you're not planning to share it, then it's okay, I don't need to hear from you. Now one of the things that we have to be sensitive of with this equipment is that the division of Philips which developed it was unceremoniously sold to Wall Street private equity in 1998. And the ensuing years probably were pretty unpleasant, resulting in some people probably losing their jobs. So I don't expect that this image here is going to be bringing back any happy memories. Nonetheless, the memory of the circle pattern and all the work behind it is well and truly alive and well today because of all the topics I've covered so far, it has turned out to be by far the most popular. I don't know how much more I can say about it personally, but if any more information turns up or any equipment, I will certainly be making a future video about it. Anyway, that is all for today. Thanks for watching.